Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to give it a few minutes um, to allow people to find the stream and kind of join us as they arrive. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce myself. Um, welcome, welcome to Kent District Library Streaming Programs. Um, my name is Anna and I'm a librarian at the East Grand Rapids branch. Thanks for tuning in to today's What We're Learning program. Um, this will begin shortly. Before we begin, um, I am gonna share one quick promo with you um, for an, some other programs we have going on for adults this spring. <laughs> All right, thanks for tuning in this evening, everyone. Um, in case you missed it, my name is Anna. I'm a librarian at the East Grand Rapids KDL branch. Um, there are many other programs we have streaming throughout the spring, including Book Talks and Instagram Live, if you happen, happen to use Instagram, um, ongoing book clubs, and a series on community resilience put on by the World Affairs Council. Um, KDL also archives many of these programs, so if you happen to miss one, um, you can find more programs from the past um, for all ages on our Facebook page and on our YouTube page. Um, just search for Kent District Library on either of those. Um, but this evening, we are so excited to welcome Joe Ellen Clary from the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council. Celebrating Women's History Month this year, um, the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council has launched a new webpage, Women Who Ran. It features fascinating research on 47 trailblazing women of Grand Rapids who ran for office between 1887 and 1920 before women even won the right to vote. Um, so we're really excited to have Joellen here with us tonight. Joellen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Anna. Um, Tonight, we celebrate, as Anna said, pioneering women political candidates of early Grand Rapids. And decades before the 19th Amendment, I want to underscore, most people think that no women voted in the United States before 1920. Decades before that, many had actually led serious political lives and run for office. In fact, before the certification of the 19th Amendment, or yes, in 1920, uh, we had all those women who ran 82 campaigns between 1887 and 1920. Then, in 1919 and 1920 alone, they ran for city commission, the Michigan State House, and the U.S. House of Representatives, as well as city comptroller and state superintendent of public instruction, facts that usually buffalo people. Okay, we're going to start a share here now. The other thing, no, what? Wasn't it there? It's there now. What other thing? Make it bigger. Go back to PowerPoint. Yeah. And I'll try. Try what? I can't even see it. No. Okay. Phew, it's a process. Okay, Anna, can you see? Yes, we can see it, it looks okay. great. Sorry about all that time. No <laughs> problem, you are totally great. Too. <laughs> yeah, okay. it looks good. So, as she said, we're celebrating Women's History Month 2021, and the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council has launched a new webpage, Women Who Ran. You see the name of it here, as well as its subtitle, Seeking Public Office Before the 19th Amendment. We had hoped to crack a bottle of champagne with you, and I hope that um, you will at home, at least well, let's do it virtually. There's a lot to celebrate. You can find out who ran for what when and check out political biographies and data that can be searched alphabetically, chronologically by political office, occupation, marital status, reform activity, and party affiliation. In fact, have you ever heard of the Farmer Labor Party in Grand Rapids? 
The first installment of Women Who Ran, now posted online, details those 82 campaigns between 1887 and 1920 and can tell you who first won a school board seat in 1888 or a Michigan Senate seat in 1920. But I'll tell you tonight too. And I'm going to ask Anna, if she hasn't already, to put up a web link to this uh, web page, Women Who Ran, in the chat section. The new web page is fully searchable alphabetically and chronologically now from 1887 through 1920. I'll keep repeating that because that's pretty much what we're going to emphasize tonight. It's searchable by city, state, national office, occupation, marital status, reform activation, and party affiliation. You can see most of those options on the left-hand side of the screen. Today, however, I will emphasize an overview in the early years, but I'll also tell you later how to get more information about the later period today, which we have to skim over pretty much. Certainly though, be sure to raise a question about anything I ignore later and take a look at the webpage. The individual pages feature candidates. They have biographical information, even though some is skimpy. As genealogists are aware, women are often hard to find historically. And images are especially difficult until the later years. There are also, as you can see on the right-hand side, campaign information, biographical information, and then at the ends of articles, reference lists. So tonight, I want to tell you just a little bit about this 20-year project which does exist beyond the dates to tonight's limitations and has already charted women running for office throughout the 20th century. Beginning in 1998, my friend, former city clerk Sandy Wright and I, Sandy's on the top there, put together a spreadsheet that looks pretty crude today. It was based on official records only. Newspapers, you might not be aware, are anathema to clerks. So we got bloody fingers flipping through old paper filings and sore muscles from hefting huge leather-bound records in Lansing onto photocopiers. Need I say, there was no Google to be of help at that time. On this page, you can notice the no candidates language. Despite the lack of official records during the early years, we recorded what we had. Um, runs for women by city mayor and U.S. representative through 1999, but we did find very little early on. But we exhausted ourselves and the project languished, languished until 2017, when Calvin College intern Angela Chen came on board. A national crowdsourcing project, her hat was in the ring, prompted us finally to take on the earliest history using newspapers this time. School board records had only winners, and we wanted a record of everyone who had run. Notice that Angela's spreadsheet begins in 1887, which we've been touting where our current web page does. So she found the earliest women. Then, wham, the talented and dedicated Julia Baucamp cleaned up all of our previous faults, took deep dives for biographical and campaign details, composed original drafts, and created the Women's History Council's new web page itself. We can only hope that this experience will help her in her new graduate pursuits in history at the University of Delaware. In the next iteration of this program, you will also hear about Alyssa Notch from Aquinas College and Gabe Legrand from Calvin University. Alyssa is currently polishing her work on the 1920s, and Gabe is in the early stages of work on the 1930s. If you're interested to take on a decade for us, let us know. Now, please find a digital suffrage link, uh, a link to our digital suffrage exhibit in the chat box also. The early story of women's electoral history begins with school suffrage in 1867. Women couldn't just get up and vote at a certain point. When a state constitutional convention was held in 1967, cities were enabled to allow their women to vote on school issues. That, by the way, generally meant that they could also run. During long dry spells between active suffrage campaigns, 
women ran for this public office and through school board races kept the suffrage issue alive for women and in front of male voters. Cities enfranchise their women in a limited way at different times. But we will now avoid the complexities of all that and limit ourselves to Grand Rapids, which did not enfranchise its tax-paying women or those with school children until 1885. At the eight, same time that school suffrage became a possibility in the late 1860s, the Michigan Women's Club movement began. Finally, women were organizing themselves apart from men to have larger effect in the world. Here we have an image of the Ladies Literary Club building today. It was built in 1887 by the organization that had begun as a history class in 1868. Meeting outside their own parlors meant that privileged women of the day would meet a broader range of people, learn about more issues of the day, and actually speak in a non-social setting with a kind of aspect of the public. Study groups needed books, and the library collected by the Early Ladies Literary Club formed the nucle nucleus of what became the Grand Rapids Public Library. Finally, with their own building and stage, they could grow and become a greater force in the community, including endorsing women's candidates for politics. Since the 1890s, Grand Rapids' African-American women had also been forming clubs for broader purposes. And in the 1930s, the Grand Rapids Study Club, the only one remaining of five that had been here in 1907, bought a house to serve its public purpose and gather force for decades to come. Back in 1887, when the Ladies Literary Clubhouse was built and just after Grand Rapids had enfranchised its women in a limited way, one woman entirely unknown to us, except that she had been one of the first three women to run in Grand Rapids for school board, joined two early club women Melissa Holden and Frances Hillier. As you can see, we actually have a photograph of Hillier. It breaks my heart that I can't tell you more about her fascinating personal story tonight. Her painter husband in the South after the Civil War or her connection to the family for whom Fuller Avenue is named in Grand Rapids. Suffice it to say that she was also among the first women physicians in the nation and led a very full professional and personal life in Grand Rapids. Hillier was among the primary movers to establish a nurse's training school at the Union Benevolent Association, now Spectrum Health Blodgett. And she was an early officer in professional associations, which reminds me to tell you again about the web page possibility of looking through all of the occupations of women who ran for office. Among them is also listed one of the earliest attorneys in the nation and two consummate professional educators. But the first woman to win a seat on the local school board was a businesswoman, Harriet Cook. Possibly endorsement from the Grand Rapids Equal Suffrage Association helped. It had certainly showed in the gender tally of the vote, supposedly 500 of her 675 winning votes. Sometimes I think there were different boxes for male and female voters. That's how they had separate counts. In any case, outside of Cook's dressmaking business, she took an active interest in the newly formed state level suffrage organization and testified in 1889 at a Michigan hearing on broader municipal suffrage for women. You'll notice that we have not been able to find an image of Harriet Cook, mover and shaker, though she was. But we do have a, a photo of Hannah Wallen, who also ran in 1888, but it's from her obituary in 1914. Wallen is our best example so far of a committed club woman, but she was not elected despite her connections to the prestigious Park Congregational Church the Daughters of the American Revolution, and the Ladies Literary Club. Running the next year in 1899 was Emma Coppins, 
a teacher and artist who showed two paintings at the Detroit Museum of Art's first ever annual, annual exhibition of American art. The only visual evidence we have for her is this advertisement for her art school in an 1889 city directory. We will make occasional references to our sources throughout. Including references to the three early to the early campaign announcements that you see here. Women in the 19th century had to be trained to want to be seen and heard in public. That's a program in itself. But we think that these announcements were probably never published in newspapers, but were circulated among potential women voters. We found these in the scrapbook of Emily Burton Ketchum, the most noted Grand Rapids suffragist in a mighty throng. Although her announcement is from 1891, Lydia DeCamp Goodrich on the left here had become the second woman seated on the Grand Rapids School Board in 1889. So two women were seated for the first time until Nancy Andrus, another city physician, became the lone woman in 1891. Once again, we have no picture, although Andrus makes large tracks through city history. She played an active role in local and state medical organizations and like Hillier, spoke and published on medicine and opening doors for women. One of a growing number of women to campaign for school board during the 1890s was Margaret Downs in 1892. More importantly, but related, Downs was an active suffragist throughout her life and was a mainstay in the Grand Rapids Women's Civic League, which held the suffrage movement together during the 19 aughts, which was a truly dry spell. There wasn't much of an actual suffrage organization, so the broader Civic League um, paid attention and backed women candidates. Downs herself was a prolific public speaker, and you can see from the title of one of her scripts here that was published in the Grand Rapids Herald in 1911 that she published her talks. Through our research on women who ran for office, we have found multiple clues and other bits of information to enrich our other histories on Grand Rapids women not just the suffrage movement, but in education, the professions, etc. Tonight, we can only provide you glances at moments from the past, of course, but I want to convince you that there are some great stories to be found. Margaret Andrew, for example, the fourth woman overall to win a school board seat, had to withdraw from her second campaign because of a so-called textbook war. This was a war over kickbacks. Not that we think Margaret Andrew was involved, but she was on the committee. Andrew's civic interests, however, included building schools, libraries, and other social and cultural institutions, as well as reforming current practices within them. She was a tireless advocate for the kindergarten movement. In case you didn't know, there wasn't always a kindergarten. Her article depicted here from 1901 is part of her effort to convince people that children actually developed, that they needed special kinds of educational techniques. Among the most colorful women ever to be mentioned in Grand Rapids history is Elizabeth Eaglesfield on your left here, one of the nation's earliest attorneys. You'll see from her advertisement in Grand Rapids that she hung up her shingle here in 1878, the year that she also had graduated from the University of Michigan Law School, which fact is carved on her tombstone. Actually, in trying to practice law and make a living, Eaglesfield found herself in shady real estate deals. At the same time, she did significant work on the 1890s suffrage movement. Still, her heart seemed to be more in her later life as a fruit boat skipper and lake lawyer, trying her wits against authorities all around Lake Michigan, especially in Wisconsin. Eaglesfield shared a home with club woman Margaret Parsons for 25 years. Parsons is here on your right. There is a huge story to be written about this early partnership between women and everything they were involved in. For now, I can only tell you that Parsons polled only two votes in her run in 1890 and Eaglesfield only one 
1894, when they were the lone women running for office. I'm sure there's a story there too, but they did keep women's names on the ballot. Josephine Annafeld Goss deserves a lot of space, and you will hear about her again. The history of this education professional spans classroom teaching to administering schools, and finally to longtime service on the Board of Education. Until after her husband's death, she was back in the school system, lobbying for open air schools to prevent tuberculosis, inventing child sized seats, supporting controversial manual education. While Goss was not the first woman to be reelected, she became the first ever to be reelected over and over again from 1986 through 196 campaigns. We can also see her, he, so here, that with her campaigns, women's organizations beyond the suffrage movement had started endorsing candidates in the newspapers. Also during Goss's tenure, there was an 1899 explosion of women on the school board. This image is from a scrapbook of materials saved by Aldi Louise Tuck Blake, who's in the center here. That scrapbook is another absolutely wonderful primary source for us. Three women had served on a school board, in fact, just two years before. But in 1899, during the run-up to the election of these, eight, these suffragists in Grand Rapids, the city had been planning to host the national suffrage movement here, and their promotional skills had been in high gear. Culminating both the decade of the 1890s and the end of the century, the National American Woman Suffrage Association met in Grand Rapids for the only time in Michigan and for only the third time outside Washington, DC. This is a photo from a reenactment in 1999. The meeting in 1899 Grand Rapids brought people, resources, and attention to the Midwest, to critical battleground states. The meeting in Grand Rapids was notable because there were obvious gestures toward inclusion. The Temple Emanuel rabbi opened proceedings, see him on the right side of the slide, and the Queen of the Poles, Valeria Lipchinsky, attended, as did Lottie Wilson Jackson as the lone African-American delegate representing the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Her presence there can illustrate for us the long history of fraught gender race relations during the suffrage movement's 70 years. The wavering race relations in a vulnerable movement with its most vulnerable citizens. The fate of Jackson's resolution in 1899 that NASA National American Women's Suffrage Association, um, that they boycott states with Jim Crow laws regarding railroad travel highlights this. It was tabled as outside the purview of the convention. There were parallel and intersecting efforts among all feminists from abolition on, but perhaps they met most easily in the temperance movement, which had endorsed Goss. On the right here, as Lucy Thurman, whose national career had begun in Jackson, Michigan with the WCTU, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, and the National Association of Colored Women. On her coattails rode Grand Rapids African-American women who became well known in their own right. They were all supporters of women's suffrage. On the left here is Grand Rapids' Mar Mary Roberts Tate, a national lecturer who spoke at the memorial program of the prestigious Ladies Literary Club after the death of Susan B. Anthony. You can see her name on the bottom left there. The electoral history of local African-American women didn't begin until 1951, however, but it grew steadily as sentiment for second wave feminism later helped inspire all women to throw their hats in the ring again. Back in 1902, after the 1899 convention, the campaign of Annette Richards can illustrate for us how the steady electoral efforts kept women's suffrage in front of citizens on the ground where they lived, however much the larger movement languished. 
A constitutional amendment in the state of Michigan in 1908, however, had stopped the decades long petitioning efforts of women who had kept voting rights on men's referenda ballots in November's year after year. Suddenly they couldn't do this again and they were at sea for a while. But one other local action during this period opened up another office for which women could run. Remember, they've only been able to run for school board until now, and only some women, taxpaying women um, with or with children in the schools. In 1903, the governance of the library was removed from the control of the Board of Education when a charter amendment created a separate library commission to be elected by popular vote. Five women threw their hats in the ring immediately. Two you have met briefly, Mary Bryant, whose 1893 campaign announcement you have seen, and Aldie Blake, one of the three women serving on the school board in 1899. Pictured here are Lois Felker and Ellen Dean. Now, none of our five women won a seat in 1903, and these two never ran again after this race, but they all stood up to make the public take note that tax paying women could now run for a second political office. Cornelia Steckety Hulst, the fifth candidate for library commission in 1903, ran into trouble in the future when she was deemed unpatriotic during World War I for an article she published that was previous or previous to the war, critical of the British Empire. I just want to remind us again, many of the women we have found while researching their electoral runs have amazing stories. And we can see on the lower right that Hulst registered for World War I activity, perhaps in an attempt to rehabilitate herself. After um, one of the five women, Lois Felker, had lost again for library commission in 1904, women must have been discouraged about their chances to win seats on the commission. Two more women ran in 1917 and 1918 and lost. Then not until that crusader Josephine Annafeld Goss ran in 1921 was there a winner. And by 1924, she was the president of the commission. But women established no real presence there until much later in the 20th century. So not only had the library commission so far fizzled as an opportunity for women candidates, in 1905, a city charter revision made winning school board elections far more difficult. Prior elections had taken place independently within each city ward, where women would have been best known by their neighbors. In 1905, the charter revision created a new system where school trustees would be elected at large from the entire city. Now the city would be considered one big district with one election, benefiting people who had already who already had public standing through their pro professions, business, and political worlds. And we should note men's clubs. Endorsed by the influential Grand Rapids Ladies Literary Club, Annette Holt threw her hat in the ring in 1908. Once again, in 1909, she ran, but this time she was also endorsed by the Grand Rapids Federation of Women's Clubs, as well as the Grand Rapids Women's Missionary Social Union. But it was still not enough and she did not win the seat. Holt, as had many earlier losing candidates, kept a woman's name on the ballot and had reason to run linked to another burning passion. She was a tireless advocate for children in a society without social safety nets. Nothing that we have today. Her anti-child labor work and anti-child slavery work intersected with efforts to keep children in school, especially during economic downturns. Now we're to the 1910s, about which um, I spoke in more detail last week, and I hope that Anna will post in the chat box a link to that program. Um, we're going to do a quick cruise through this latter part of the um, web page that the um, that women of women who ran covers um, during the 1910s you'll notice a number of women running uh, the 1910s began in peace and prosperity but ended in war and pandemic 
And Grand Rapids women had opportunities to sophisticate their political game, claim party affiliations, and carry their visions and concerns into public office. So we now enter a decade when first wave feminism culminated and women exploded into a larger electoral arena. Public issues became more intense with recent influxes of immigrant labor, fueling local factories and creating conditions ripe for labor unrest. War in Europe loomed until it broke out and dragged in the United States in 1917. And through it all, women candidates for office benefited from a reawakening suffrage movement after a period often dubbed the long slog. Suddenly, in 1910, however, there was new energy. Nationally, the suffrage movement had been re-energized by some wins, and Grand Rapids women restructured their suffrage efforts and hit the street, as this quote testifies. 75 suffragists followed in bunting-laden cars in one of the earliest parades in U.S. history. Their experience in a 1912 mailroom processing some six tons of suffrage material tutored women learning to use burgeoning print media resources more effectively. And taking over the Grand Rapids Press in May 1914 gave women even more inside experience. In their safe suffrage takeover edition, you can see that the wits among them were inspired. Local men whose names are along, across the bottom of this cartoon are positioned according to their suffrage um, attitudes, behind the fence, supporting in front of the fence, or on the fence. During this time, a third physician suffragist, Emma Nichols Wanty, had run her first campaign in 1908. Remember, after the at-large voting that was started in 1905. Um, she had been appointed earlier, though, in 1906, to complete the term of Josephine Annefeld Goss, whose husband was mortally ill. As I've noted, Goss had been the mainstay on the Grand Rapids school boards during a tough set of years surrounding that charter revision. So Wanti not only had big shoes to fill, she would become the lone visible presence of a woman in the only office really available to women. Still, occasional confident women candidates stepped forward, and now they were running against each other. And Wanti had a formidable opponent, whom you can see named here in an Opportunity Club announcement. Her opponent was Christian scientist Agnes Chalmers, who sparred with the well-known physician Wanti over the contentious question of medical inspections in schools. But from the midst of the, their fight, they made it clear that while their stances differed on some specifics, they were allies in the larger fight. You'll have to visit our webpage or listen to my program on the 1910s for a story of fraud against Chalmers involving John W. Blodgett and other prestigious Grand Rapidians. But in fact, both Wanti and Chalmers won their races. And for a few years, there were two women again on the school board. In order to rehabilitate herself, perhaps, um, you can see that Chalmers that could also use the press. She took a photographer along with her on a trip to a manual training class and offered a little gender education. She operated saws, lathes, and planers and kept all her fingers, as you can see. During the very same month as this election in 1911, 6,000 workers walked off the job in the famous Grand Rapids furniture strike. They struck over poor wages, long hours, and exploitative working conditions. This longest and most violent strike in Grand Rapids history transformed city politics. Some think negatively, but it, also, it certainly had a lasting effect on women's electoral history. Please notice in our web pages section on party affiliations, how many women socialists entered the, the electoral fray in the wake of the strike? Well before the Red Scare of 1917, socialists were perceived as a threat to vested interests. These women, starting in 1912, stepped onto another public stage and ran for school board positions to give another face to socialists. In every case, 
these women were consistently dubbed as women socialists in the newspapers, and they ran very poorly. Today, I can only report that in 1910, Sarah Hagel on the left here had formed the Grand Rapids Equal Opportunity Club for women not affiliated with the local club life of more prestigious women. Virtually all of the socialist women who ran for office were members of this organization. And Mary Hay, whom you can see on the right, was publicly supported by the Grand Rapids Socialist Party, whose treasurer she was. Soon after, when World War I shook the nation, women came together in a massive mobilization across races, religions, and new immigrant groups. They formed a coalition including not only the organizations of the connected, but other parallel women's groups of African American women, Polish Catholic women, and the city's Jewish women. Note, just even when the YWCA, the Women's Christian Temperance, uh, YWCA Women's Young Women's Christian Association started in 1900. No um, Catholics, African-Americans, or Jews need apply. All of these women came together in World War I work. And it was not lost on women that the moment could further their political and personal goals. Within weeks of US entry in April 1917, 17,000 women's committees sprang up nationwide, enabled in part by suffrage organizational and communication structures, which did not fail to educate the public and politicians on their mammoth accomplishments. In fact, in November 1918, just before the war ended, the male voters of Michigan were finally convinced to fully enfranchise their women. And the national suffrage map here illustrates a huge inroad had been made into the Midwest. Notice that the states with full suffrage for women were almost exclusively out west. New York had fully enfranchised its women a year before Michigan, which may have helped Michigan. And it's definitely thought that those two victories helped along um, the federal or the federal certification of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Back now to 1919, with the Michigan win, overt partisan politics enter the frame, as well as a new series of firsts in runs for office. Women could now run for any office they chose, and they did. City offices still were not partisan, but legislative races were in the offing, and women began committing themselves to particular parties. Notice here that by 1920, only four women running for office had identified themselves as either Democrats or Republicans, not as many as the proclaimed socialists. Um, most women didn't say, and they didn't have to. Etta M. Smith became the first woman in city history in 1919 to compete for the city commission. And today she offers us a chance to counter much received wisdom about firsts in Grand Rapids women's history. Our examples from first wave feminism were so thoroughly excised from our city history that people haven't realized that there were very few positions for which women did not compete before the 1970s. The only ones, I think, were judgeships and the mayor's office. Even though 1919 was an off year for state legislative races, women took on the state campaigns that were on offer, like the University Board of Region, University of Michigan Board of Regents and State Superintendent of Public Instruction. Um, you can't read this, I know, but I wanted to show it to you. Of the five women who ran statewide for state office in 1919, two were from Grand Rapids. At the very top of that Bay City ad, was placed Grand Rapids' Mary Hinsdale, the first woman ever to run in the first year any woman could run for Michigan Superintendent of Public Instruction. Clearly, women in 1919 felt that Hinsdale, who had graduate education from Radcliffe and a PhD from the University of Michigan, could win. To date, however, it took until 2018 for a woman even to be appointed as acting superintendent.
there's still a glass ceiling there. Etta Comstock Boltwood, also on that list, was one of the first two women running for positions on the University of Michigan Board of Regents in 1919. The ad you see here was used in 1927 when she ran again and makes the same point that 2,000 girls in the University of Michigan need a woman regent. The point was finally taken two years later when a woman won. The next year, 1920, was the first big election year when Michigan women could run even, or could even run for national office. One did, and for the state house, two did. When Etta M. Smith had first run for city commission in 1919, she emerged as quite probably the Grand Rapids woman most experienced in partisan politics. She was the first woman ever to preside over a political convention in Michigan when she was elected permanent chair of the Kent County Democrats. Then she ran as a Democrat for seat in the Michigan legislature. I wanna tell you just a little bit more about her because she doesn't show up in other um, organizational histories um, or in newspapers uh, for those kinds of things. But she didn't come out of nowhere. She had been a longtime officer for both the local and state level Rebecca's associated with the Association of Odd Fellows. With the Rebecca's, Smith had gained the leadership, speaking, publicity, knowledge of issues, and organizational skills that underwrote her political campaigns and which could have granted her two firsts. Again, this electoral history work has lifted the veil on another category of women who had burning interests in public policy issues and the pursuit of office. Aldi Louise Tuck Blake was the other Grand Rapids woman running for state representative in 1920, this time as a Republican. Aldi Blake threw her hat in the ring for state legislature and was among the early women brazen enough to run ads actually in newspapers. Both Smith and Blake lost their races in 1920. But another Grand Rapids woman, Eva McCall Hamilton, did become the first Michigan woman ever to be seated in the Michigan legislature. In fact, in the state Senate. Remember that all three women were able to run their campaigns prior to the certification of the National Amendment in 1920 on August 26th, because they had already been enfranchised in Michigan in 1918. They were not dependent upon the 19th Amendment and their races started before it was certified. Currently, Eva McCall Hamilton's portrait is the only one of a woman hanging in the Michigan Senate chamber. In 1920, she became not only the first Grand Rapids woman to serve in the state legislature, she remained the only for nearly 100 years until in 2018, current Senator Winnie Brinks won her seat. And it was uh, the next senator after Hamilton, I believe, was from Detroit and in the 1950s. Here is a quick peek ahead. Once again, drawn from our crude 1999 spreadsheet, a quick look at um, some races in 1972. I want to tell you that only about 15 women had run for public office during the 1990s. That shot up to nearly 60 during the 1970s in an explosion of runs for office. And that in turn underwrote over 80 in the um, 1980s and 90s. Check out the list here from the national to the local, including mayor and county treasurer. Also on the 1999 electoral history draft, you would see that African-American women's, the African-American women's population had increased enough to run um, first, uh, Ethel B. Coe in Harriet Woods Hill in 1951 for a charter commission and school board, respectively. After that, there were occasional runs by women like Ella Sims until the 1970s when more women were running for everything. Nina Lewis Sleet was the first woman, African-American woman to serve on the school board, but she was appointed in the late 1960s. And I believe that Linda Johnson was the first elected in 1977, the first black woman to um, win a seat, uh, public office. Um, 
I think African-American women attorneys did not show up in Grand Rapids until the 1980s. So these electoral runs were, were a feat. The population was still growing and being connected. From the vantage point of the late 20th century, let's remind ourselves, however, after looking, peaking in all that activity late in the century, that as soon as women could run for an office, generally someone did. In 1920, the socialist Violet Blumenberg ran as a presidential elector for her party, and a Republican named Alita Wheeler ran for the U.S. House of Representatives. Then, except for a 1934 run, which you'll see at the bottom here, run for the U.S. House by Laurel Costin for the Farmer Labor Party, no one ran for Congress again until Jean McKee in 1972. Her name was on that list. There was a long dry spell through much of the 20th century. We can look back in relief, however, at one last player from the earlier days, Gray Sames Van Hosen. Not only had Van Hosen run losing campaigns for school board in 1915 and 1919, and for city commission in 1923, this businesswoman served as the last president of the Grand Rapids Eagle Franchise Club begun in 1910 and was president of the county suffrage organization as well. She was busy campaigning and losing, but really busy with suffrage politics. Then, seen second from the left here, Van Hosen served among the earliest officers of the Michigan League of Women's Voters when the suffrage movement transformed itself for life after the 19th Amendment. It had begun its proud history in Grand Rapids, in fact, that's where it was formed. Despite their get out the vote efforts during the 1920s, fewer women were running than earlier. But ben Hosen wasn't finished yet. So far, we have discussed no runs for county office. In 1930, she was the first woman to run a campaign for county commission then known as the Board of Supervisors, and she won. Not just once, but four times. Until she was defeated in 1938, Grace Ames and Hosen had served with the guys, nearly 40, through most of the Depression. So far as we know, no other city in the United States has a comprehensive electoral history. To date, we have documented nearly 1,000 campaigns at this stage in our work. But because of limited resources, we have not even been able to extend our project throughout Kent County. We have stayed within the borders of Grand Rapids. So we can only imagine what other surprises remain to be discovered in the area. But please keep up with us and remember to watch the link to the program in the 1910s and take a fuller look online at what we know now. Finally, let's tip our hats, not only to the winners from the past, but to all contenders who also ran, who pushed ahead the prospects of all women to come. And let me personally thank everyone who has worked on the Women Who Ran project or who has shown interest over the years. I thank the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council for so generously sponsoring the last push and hosting the results on its website. Um, I think you'll find links to the 1910s, to the Women Who Ran website, um, et cetera, on, in the chat box. This has not been quite the celebration we had planned. We would have normally had a major reception with champagne flowing. But please do lift a glass from home to all of these pioneering women candidates from the past. And thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you so much, Joellen. That was lovely. I'm sure you had to um, make some difficult cuts to fit it in our time constraints. So I appreciate you doing the the difficult work of um, <laughs> picking and choosing the details because I'm sure there's so much. A thousand campaigns is a lot. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, in, and and prob probably made by, um, and that's just through 1999. Um, mm. We've done a little isolated work here and there, um, filling in some gaps with African-American women's history or on county commission campaigns. But um, pretty much that's only up to that point. Gotcha. So you in 
um, in an ideal world, you would expand beyond Grand Rapids into the rest of Kent County if you had limitless resources or time or? Well, we, yes, we would. And in an ideal world, we would have peer institutions who would be doing this for their own cities. Um, mm. It's been noted more and more recently how unique the Greater Grand Rapids Women's History Council is. Um, we don't have peer institutions who have quite the same ambitions doing city histories as we do, or when we certainly haven't had mentor organizations. So we can't compare our findings at this point to any to anyone else. Um, we can't entirely say this was unique or this was typical. Um, we have some sense about that. And so we would like to see everybody doing this, digging deep where they are. Um, people forget that women's history nationally didn't really begin until the 1970s. Mm. And so there are lots and lots of gaps. Doing local history is doing national history. Yeah, yeah, I can certainly appreciate that after watching this particular presentation, yeah. Um, yeah, it must be difficult to be the first in a lot of those ways, right? I mean, I'm, I'm sure there will be organizations that appreciate it who follow you, the ones who follow you <laughs> will appreciate it, but I'm sure it's, yeah, sort of a lot, a bit of a wilderness to wander through all of that information and all that research. It can be, but it's also very exciting. Um, we, for example, when I was first in town um, in the 1990s, I was told that the first women to run for um, the county commission were in the 1970s. The first woman ever to run for city commission was in 1961, and they all won. Um, but they were dead wrong. <laughs> Once we started doing this, as I said tonight, the first woman to run for city commission was in 1919, the first time she could legally run. And um, so there, and no one else, yes, a couple more women ran, um, but not for a long time during that dead zone in the middle of the backlash of the mm. 20th century until 1961. Um, but Grace Ames Van Hosen, 1930 through 1938, she served during the Depression. We still haven't done the deep down digging about her um, work on that, and that will be mm. exciting. Um, but otherwise, the next women to run, even, then and when, were in the 1970s. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But everything's I, new. It's been fun. Yeah, yeah. It does make me so curious when you said that. Um, which position was she reelected for several times? County Commission. It was called County Board Commission. of Supervisors then. Okay. And uh, we have this long shot. You saw that little photo of Grace and her hat surrounded mm -hmm. by a handful of men. There's yeah. this long, long shot we have, a panoramic shot of Grace with 36 or 8, 38 other county supervisors, all male. And that was the case for eight years. Yeah, that's striking. It does make me so curious what, yeah, what her presence was like to get reelected that many times. She was clearly doing something right, <laughs> but. Yeah, well, as I, as I mentioned briefly, um, Van Holsen was schooled. She was an accountant mm -hmm. and worked until she inherited some family money, I think, in a meat packing factory in Grand Rapids. Oh. So when she first ran for school board in 1915, it was advertised that she was the first business woman, a uh, woman okay. who was working in the business world um, to run for office. And she, after that, um, became especially um, versatile in matters of industry and women working in factories and that kind of thing. So for the suffrage movement and for the later League of Women Voters, she worked for... Um, in, in those those sorts of committees and labor issues. So she was um, well prepared hmm. to go on to the county commission and took skills with her that I'm guessing a lot of the other commissioners didn't have. Hmm, that makes sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to just mention again, if anyone has questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. We haven't had any pop up just yet. Um, but I was wondering as well, the. Um, Oh, I lost her name. Um, early on in the presentation, the mm -hmm. person you said who had a connection to the Fuller family or the family who oh, yes. Fuller is Nancy, named for. Nancy do you know Fuller. that off? Yeah. Do you know Nancy that off the top Fuller. of your head? Samuel L. Fuller. Yeah. What um, was the connection? Oh, her mother married him when she was eight years old. Um, oh. he, was, he must have been a widower. and She was. 
And so when Frances Hillier was eight, she moved to Grand Rapids with her mother when she married Samuel L. Fuller. Um, and oh. it's, Hillier has just an amazing story. She's not the only one either. But so yeah. as I said, this can be fun. Um, Hillier graduated from Washington, D.C.'s Howard University's medical school. Hmm. Even then, was known mostly as an African American school, and because her degree is from Howard University, you will still find Frances Hillier listed on all kinds of lists of early African American women physicians. Um, wow. she, married, <laughs> she married a landscape painter who was relatively well known, Hillier, and I believe he inherited some property um, after the Civil War in Tennessee, where they moved for a while, and with his mother started a plantation school for former slave children. Mm. So her life experiences are just all over the place. Once she got to Grand Rapids, she became, you know, she was involved in all kinds of clubs and hospitals, as I mentioned. And this was at a time when hospitals and nursing programs were just being started. Most people don't realize that all of the um, schooling, the programs that we're used to today, from social safety net, social security, Medicare, Medicaid, none of that existed. And in fact, many nurses weren't well-trained at all. So Grand Rapids was a real center for that. Um, we also had, in the 1890s, more women physicians than the city had in 1950. Um, it was much easier going to medical school in the 19th century than it was to go to law school because there were all those women's bodies and for the most part, these women physicians took care of women and children. But in law school, for like for Elizabeth Eaglesfield, it was really tough to get a degree because it was really tough after that to litigate. If you didn't have full legal standing as a citizen, not that many people were going to gamble on you arguing their case in the court of law. Hmm. And that's one reason um, that she led such a colorful life. Um, on top of the fact that she was just that kind of personality. Yeah, does it make you wish you could meet them? It's <laughs> so interesting. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And the, these sorts of dives are the, ne are the next best thing. So as I said, anyone who's interested in taking on a little work on some individual people or an individual decade, please, please, please let us know. We're going to be moving on this. Yeah, so is the long-term goal to um, kind of fill in the database with every woman who's ever run, essentially? Absolutely, yep. That's great. Through the, through the present moment. Okay. Um, the, um, I can tell you, I mean, there, there are some surprise, things that are surprising, not in, in a positive way. When in 2011, I believe it was, the Women's History Council had a reception for the current um, woman chair of the county commission, Sandy Frost Parish, remember her name right now, um, and as well as Mar Marge Byington, who was the first woman chair of the county commission, we did some real research coming up to that point on women who had run and won seats on the county commission. And I discovered, alas, that there was a year after the 2000 when there were no women on the city county commission, I'm sorry, this is county commission, hmm. on the county commission. And that's the board, the body with the most seats of any. Hmm. Um, representing all townships all over the place. So, so there are lots of opportunities to run and women can run in their own neighborhoods. There have been a lot more women recently and we have another um, woman who's been running the county commission, Mandy Bolter. Um, but so it's a roller coaster. Hmm. Um, Every now and then we'll have a year declared the year of the woman. On woman. Um, 2018, a lot, a lot of women um, won public mm. office, as they did in um, 1990. But then there will be um, lags. It's just not yet mm. as easy for women to run for office, and they're not as supported. Yeah, yeah. It'll be interesting to see those patterns emerge the more you're able to kind of fill in the gaps as you go. Yeah. yeah, there's there's just so much. Even with just what's online on our website, there is so much material for anyone who's into analysis to spend a, <laughs> spend a little time with. So yes, if we can achieve our goal and create an entire complete um, city's electoral history for our women, um, that's that will be huge. And basically, the digital suffrage exhibit 
which you posted a link to earlier, mm -hmm. was yeah. our big gift to the community last year during mm -hmm. 2020, the centennial of the 19th Amendment. And it puts Grand Rapids on the map in terms of suffrage history, which it hadn't been to date. Most suffrage histories for Michigan have been written only about the southeast corner of the state. And in fact, the southeast corner lagged West Michigan um, in the 19th century and early 20th century. Movement. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so that's, that's information that researchers can use. The women's electoral history um, already has lots of good information that can be used not just for school projects, but by mm -hmm. academic researchers, by professional historians. And also, um, we link to um, a big database uh, hosted by the Grand Rapids Public Library Archive on 23,000 women who registered for war work during World War I. Remember oh, you wow. saw the registration card for Cornelia Steckety Hulst? Yeah. There's something like 117 skill sets that were surveyed, mm. lots of personal information, probably around 140 um, boxes for the spreadsheet, for the database. Wow. That if you want to know how many African-American women of half the women's adult population in Grand Rapids at the time, well, actually in Kent County at the time, um, you can dump them out by race, religion, immigration status, all, just all kinds of things. That in itself is just an astonishing uh, resource for re for researchers from genealogists to people writing sociologies of women in 1918. So we're really trying to build content. Hmm. And with these, with these projects, we're getting beyond individual women's biographies. You can see how much they matter base level, but we're learning so much more about how women clump together and work together to create the broader women's history we have. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Joellen, for, um, I don't know, your evident enthusiasm and hard work, because it is clear that you and your team have put in so much into it um, over the years, but especially with this most recent um, piece, it's just really fascinating to kind of get a little snippet of it. So we really appreciate your time. Um, we're so thrilled to have had you, and I hope we can do this again sometime in person. <laughs> that would be fun. Thanks so much. Yes, Bye -bye. Yeah. Now, Take now care. we'll get out the champagne. Yes, yes, please do. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Please join us next week, or I'm sorry, in two weeks for our next um, Wednesday night program. Good night.